Section 12, Part 2 of The Empire of Business by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Carroll. The Empire of Business, Section 12, Wealth, Part 2. There is one class of millionaires whose wealth, in very much greater degree than others, may be credited to themselves, inventors. Graham Bell of the Telephone, Edison of numerous inventions, Westinghouse of the Air Brake, and others, who originated or first applied processes hitherto unused, and were sufficiently alive to their pecuniary interests to hold large shares in the companies, formed to develop and introduce them to the public. Their wealth had its origin in their own inventive brains. All honor to the inventor. He stands upon a higher platform than the others. It may be said that in greater or lesser degree our leading manufacturers, railroad builders, department store projectors, meat packers, and other specialists in one line or another had to adopt new methods and, with few if any exceptions, there can be traced in their careers some special form of ability upon which their success depended, thus distinguishing them from the mass of competitors. No doubt this is correct, yet the inventions or processes used were the work of others, so that all they did was to introduce new methods of management or to recognize and utilize opportunities. This the inventor class have also done if they have become millionaires. But in addition, they have invented the new processes, so that these deserve to reap beyond the other class, yet only in degree, because both classes alike depend upon increasing population, the masses who require or consume the article produced, so that even the inventor's wealth is in great part dependent upon the community which uses his productions. It is difficult to understand why, at the death of its possessor, Great wealth gathered or created in any of these or in other forms should not be shared by the community which has been the most potent cause or partner of all in its creation. We have seen that enormous fortunes are dependent upon the community. Without great and increasing population, there could be no great wealth. Where wealth accrues honorably, the people are always silent partners. It is not denied that the great administrator, whether as railroad builder, steamship owner, manufacturer, merchant, or banker, is an exceptional man, or that millions honestly made in any useful occupation give evidence of ability, foresight, and assiduity above the common, and prove the man who has made them a very valuable member of society. In no wise, therefore, should such men be unduly hampered or restricted as long as they are spared. After all, they can absorb comparatively little, and generally speaking, the money-making man in contrast to his heirs, who generally become members of the smart or fast set, is abstemious, retiring, and little of a spendthrift. The millionaire himself is probably the least expensive bee in the industrial hive, taking into account the amount of honey he gathers and what he consumes. Practically every thousand of his money is at work for the development of the country and earning interest, much of it paying labor. In the interests of the community, therefore, he should not be disturbed while gathering honey, provided it be destined largely for the general hive, under a just system of taxation when he passes away. Those who have not had opportunity to study the operation of wealth in the world are naturally led astray. They see its possessors, in their palaces, surrounded with every luxury, their gorgeous carriages in the park. They read of their extravagant balls, of riotous living, and inordinate expenditure, and worse than this, of gambling at cards and upon horses. Horse racing in Britain, unfortunately, is still under the highest patronage, sights naturally hard to bear by those suffering for the necessities of life. The writer has no desire to minimize this sad contrast nor to say one word in its defense. It is one of the saddest and most indefensible of all contrasts presented in life. 
But when we proceed to trace the work of wealth as a whole, it is soon found that even these extravagances absorbed but a small fraction of it. The millionaire's funds are all at work. Only a small sum lies in bank, subject to check. Our railways and steamships, mills and furnaces, industrial structures, and much of the needed working capital to keep these in operation are the result of invested wealth. The millionaire with two, or the new multimillionaire with twenty million sterling, keep only trifling sums lying idle. All else they put to work, much of it employing labor. They cannot escape this unless they turn misers and keep the gold to gloat over, which no rich man does whom the writer knows or has heard of. On the contrary, the millionaire as a rule is both mindful and shrewd, more apt than those of smaller fortune to invest his capital carefully. Besides, he is usually a man of simple tastes and averse to display. Whatever impressions the workers may receive of the wealthier classes, the fact is indisputable that their surplus money, minus a small fraction, must augment the wage fund and in some line or other benefit those who labor. Even their extravagances must in their course contribute to the business of many people struggling to obtain a competence, and hence to employment of labor. Little can be spent by the rich without drawing upon the labor of others, which must be paid for. All that millionaires can get out of life is superior food, raiment, and shelter. Only a small, a very small percentage of all his millions can be absolutely wasted. When the socialist, therefore, speaks of all wealth going back to the state, he proclaims no great change in its mission. The state, sole owner, would use it just as the owners now use all but a fraction of it, that is, invested in some of the multiform ways leading to the reward of labor. It is simply a question whether state as against individual control of wealth would prove more productive, which, judging from experience of state and individual management so far as yet tested, may gravely be doubted. It could not make much difference to the workers whether the title to wealth rested in the state or in individuals, if the state decided, as individuals do now, to recompense labor according to value as determined by demand, the fairest standard. All would remain very much as now. One would still get five talents, one ten, and a few would get very many talents, and individualism would reign. The bridge has yet to be found that spans the gulf between equal and unequal compensation for varied service. Yet, until this be found, we believe it to be non-existent and impossible to devise, there can be no communism, nor indeed any milder form of socialism to which serious objection need be made by earnest improvers of present conditions, since the absorption of private property and equal compensation, the two pillars of revolutionary socialism, are inevitably relegated to the distant future until a practicable mode of obtaining and managing them be found. We hear far too much these days upon the subject of wealth as the main object of life. Only by the manual working man and poorer classes is money regarded as the great idol of our age, before which all fall prostrate, and this simply because it is their one pressing want in its acquisition their life work. True, wealth is displacing hereditary rank, which, until our own day, held foremost position in Britain. Now the poor, average hereditary peer seeks its alliance and remains of little consequence, unless successful, because compelled to maintain an ostentatious style of living, which, without fortune, is impossible. He bargains for an heiress, because his position depends not upon his merits, but upon her wealth. This applies only to the small United Kingdom, for among our English-speaking race elsewhere throughout the world, hereditary rank is unknown. It is a survival of the past, which raises a smile, for it is amusing to watch titled personages assuming positions in state or society solely because someone who preceded them won precedence. Let this be noted by the workers, 
none of the professions regard great wealth as the chief prize. Its acquisition is not their aim. Consider the physician. When a man selects that noble career, knowing all its trials, and consecrates himself to the amelioration of human suffering, he knows well fortune is not there to be found. He has a much higher prize than wealth in view. Consider the minister who feels that he has a message to deliver to his fellows and, answering, embraces the call. Wealth does not allure him. So with the lawyer. Wealth is not in his mind as the reward of his labors. The chief justices of the Supreme Courts are above pecuniary gain. The inventor, the architect, the engineer, and the scientist all have nobler rewards before them than riches. Only a modest competence is the reasonable expectation of all these classes. The great teachers of their fellows, the presidents and the professors of our seats of learning, and the teachers of our common schools, what thought have they of bowing before the vulgar idol of wealth? Our poets, authors, statesmen, the very highest types of humanity are above the allurements of money-making. These know of higher satisfactions and nobler lives than those of the mere millionaire. Having their nobler missions, they have no time to waste accumulating dross. All these men are quite right, for beyond a competence for old age, which need not be great and may be very small, wealth lessens rather than increases human happiness. Millionaires who laugh are rare. The deplorable family quarrels which so often afflict the rich generally have their rise in sordid differences about money. The most miserable of men, as old age approaches, are those who have made money-making their god. Like flies bound to the wheel, these unfortunates fondly believed that they were really driving it, only to find, when tired and craving rest, that it is impossible for them to get off, and they are lost. Plenty to retire upon, but nothing to retire to and so they end up as they began, driving to add to their useless hordes, passing into nothingness, leaving their money behind for heirs to quarrel over, only because they cannot take it with them, a melancholy end much less enviable than that of their poorer fellows. Wealth confers no fame, although it may buy titles where such prevail. Nor are the memories of millionaires as a class fondly cherished. It is a low and vulgar ambition to amass money, which should always be the slave, never the master of man. There is one fundamental difference between rank and wealth. There can be no hereditary aristocracy of wealth. Where it is left free as a rule, it passes in three generations from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in all English-speaking lands except the United Kingdom, where the law of primogeniture and legal settlements guard a hereditary class, and defeat the operation of the natural law. In free lands, the children of millionaires and their children may be safely trusted to fulfill the law. To keep a fortune is scarcely less difficult than to acquire it. Wealth is dispersive, where unbuttressed by special laws designed to keep it in certain channels, all of which laws should be promptly repealed. Wealth in America the land of greatest fortunes, never yet has passed beyond the third generation. It seldom gets so far. We have a few, a very few families of the third generation now spending the fortunes made by their grandfathers. The two or three greatest fortunes of their day are now being freely distributed among the children and grandchildren and will be reduced to moderate sums for each when the present children reach maturity. As certain as fate many of their descendants will be found toiling as their able ancestors did in their shirt sleeves. We may safely trust those who have not made the money to prove adepts in squandering it. Great fortunes are few. The aggregate wealth embraced in these is small compared with the amount in very moderate fortunes. The former attract attention far beyond their importance. Gigantic fortunes, in the nature of things, must be fewer and harder to build up in the future than the past. Most great enterprises are now in corporate form. The writer knows of but one man now in active business who is likely to have an exceptionally large estate, and the foundation of that was laid more than half a century ago 
by the purchase of timber lands, which have increased enormously in value. We can safely trust to the free play of natural forces under progressive taxation, if not thwarted by legislation as in Britain, to prevent danger or injury to the state arising from hereditary wealth. The equal distribution of wealth is one of the loudest cries of the socialist. Let us suppose that a philanthropist, which generally means a man with more money than sense, resolved to act upon that idea and distribute his fortune among the poor of London or New York, went to them one morning and announced his purpose. He is soon surrounded and begins the distribution. Each man or woman gets pro rata, say, five pounds sterling, until many thousands are given away, the crown still constantly increasing. He returns at night to witness the result, and shudders at the vision that presents itself. Are these indeed men and women, or are they degraded wretches in human form? Is it not evident to all that the first and indispensable work of the socialist is the elevation of humanity to that standard of conduct which would ensure the wise and sober use of benefactions? We would all agree that when this necessary elevation was reached, the discussion of further steps to relieve distress would be in order. Meanwhile, the foolish distributor would have done more injury to his fellows in one day than he could probably do good all the rest of his life. Down on your knees and crawl for pardon are the words one would undoubtedly apply to such a philanthropist. Imagine every man, woman, and child in Britain receiving 250 pounds sterling, or $1,250, which is one's proportion of the national wealth, if equally divided. What would be the result? Saturnalia for a time, then rich and poor, as before slowly emerging, the last state worse than the first. It is self-evident that there is at present no foundation upon which wealth can be equally distributed. The soil has not been prepared. Seed sown upon it would be choked by thistles. Meanwhile, our immediate duty is to distribute surplus wealth to the best of our abilities in such forms as we believe best calculated to improve existing conditions and to secure its more equitable distribution hereafter by heavy progressive death duties and by assessing the people in proportion to their ability to support the government. This policy President Roosevelt is strongly advocating in America. It is much more urgently needed in Britain. Socialists generally write of wealth as if possessed by the few, but the fact must never be lost sight of that the laboring classes, in the aggregate, are great capitalists. The savings banks of New York State alone in 1906 held $1,335,000,000, owned by 2,637,235 depositors. Average deposits of $506.25. This is all the savings of the workers, for businessmen and capitalists use their money to better advantage. These banks are strictly confined by charter to investments in first-class securities, are carefully managed, and possess the confidence of the people. In the United States, the deposits in savings banks amounted to the grand total of $3,482,000,000. But this is no measure in the total savings of the working people, because in America, especially in the Western states, opportunities for more profitable investment of savings are numerous, and the rapid increase of values in real estate leads workmen to prefer investing in homes. When we consider the vast sums invested by the workers in homes, insurance cooperative, and friendly societies, and in other ways, and add these to the foregoing, the problem which the socialist writes about so glibly of transferring all wealth to the state begins to assume its true proportions. We quote from The Service of Friendly Societies by Alexander Cargill. Quote, Here is as brief a summary as possible of the position of the registered societies throughout the country, I mean in Great Britain and Ireland, as at the date of the last public return, namely 31st December 1902. First of all, we have the Friendly Societies, pure and simple, including all their branches, collecting societies, benevolent societies, working men's clubs, medical, etc., 
and it will interest you to know that the number of friendly society members on the date mentioned was 13,344,494, their funds at the same date being 44,848,575 pounds. Next, there are the cooperative societies for industries and trades, businesses and land societies. The membership of these was 2,054,835, and their funds, 43,328,078 pounds. Then we have the trade unions, which have a membership of 1,604,812, and funds amounting to 5,016,408 pounds. Workmen's compensation schemes with a membership of 122,441 and funds of 172,408 pounds. Friends of Labor Societies with a membership of 32,684 and funds of 254,426 pounds. Coming to the building societies, of which there are two kinds the incorporated, and the unincorporated. Together, they have a total membership of 595,451, with funds amounting to 63,907,087 pounds. Lastly, we have the total certified trustee and post office, peoples, and railway savings banks. These have no fewer than 10,837,186 depositors, and their funds amount to 222,677,941 pounds. Totaling all these figures together, we reach an aggregate membership of nearly 29 million, with combined funds amounting to 400 million pounds sterling. End quote. From the Service of Friendly Societies by Alexander Cargill. We give a few figures from the United States Statistical Abstract of 1906 showing deposits in postal and other savings banks in various countries in 1905. In Britain, there were $997 million in deposits, 11,694,000 depositors, with an average of $85. In Denmark, there were $205,723,000 in deposits, 1,291,000 depositors, an average of $159. In Germany, there were 2,639,590,000 in deposits, 16,613,000 depositors, with an average of $159. In France, there were $890 million in deposits, 11,768,000 depositors, with an average of $75. The aggregate of all countries which make returns is 91,273,000 depositors, with 11,801,229,509 dollars. These enormous sums are laid up where neither moth nor rust can corrupt nor thieves break through and steal. Their only danger lies in the socialistic aim to remove them from present owners and transfer them to the state, thus making the depositor's money the property of all. To return the deposits to the rightful owners or allow interest upon them would create a large capitalistic class apart from the general socialistic community, which would involve class distinctions as before, fatal to the socialistic idea. The British islands, with their 11 and one half millions of depositors in a population of, say, 45 millions, have an average of a fraction of more than one depositor in every family, allowing five to each. Serious trouble might be expected if the socialist ceased to confine himself to writing about placing all wealth in the hands of the state and begin to act. Fortunately, of this there is no danger. One of the chief objections to present-day socialism is that while it lends itself to endless talk, it is yet doomed to inaction as a system until and unless 
human nature itself is changed in the countless ages to come. Earnest and good men, touched to fine issues, should not occupy themselves, grasping at distant shadows, while the substance, improvement of the present, lies at their feet ready for treatment. There are three classes of men. The first are born in poverty and probably have to see the harrowing sight of father and mother, sister and brother, suffering from want. As a holy duty, they resolve to drive the wolf from the door and make fortunes. Young men with such experiences go into the world resolved to win. They must win, and the business life furnishes their best chance of victory in our time. Their foot once upon the ladder, it was comparatively easy climbing, even in Britain until recent times, for it was the center of material development in the early part of last century. In America, it has long been and still is much easier to accumulate wealth than elsewhere. The Republic is soon to dwarf all other civilized countries in wealth and population. It is the land of millionaires, and the new genus of multimillionaire has just made its appearance there. Notwithstanding this, what has been said of the professional classes is eminently true of those of the Republic. Its best men and women have little in common with the makers and possessors of vast fortunes as a class. Not that those born in poverty should not aspire to higher positions, enabling them to influence others more potently for good, not that they should not gather gear by every while that's justified by honor, for it is, as a rule, only after man has provided for himself and family that he can be of much lasting good to others. He must surely recognize this to be his first duty. But if any provide not for his own, and specially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. A few, a very few exceptional men and women appear at intervals in the world who seemingly need to take little thought of themselves or those dependent upon them. Their fellows are captivated with their devotion to the general wheel and provide for them. But such characters are rare, and as a rule it is necessary for all to take care of themselves as the first duty. The never-to-be-forgotten truth is that huge fortunes, so far as their owners are concerned, are as useless as star and garter are to their possessors, and not so ornamental. And this truth above all, that these fortunes cannot give their owners more out of life worth having than is secured by a competence so modest that men beginning as workers can, with health, ability, and sobriety, win for old age. We have prominent instances of this among the working men, members of parliament scattered throughout Britain, America, Canada, and Australasia. John Burns, cabinet minister, one of the most remarkable working men, the late Sir Randall Kremer, Thomas Burt, and others stand at the head. Several have reached the highest office upon earth, the presidency of the majority of the English-speaking people. This is only what we have right to expect, for not a few of the greatest geniuses have been manual workers. In new countries, millions of men who began as manual workers have achieved moderate competence. Almost without exception, the millionaires of today have made their millions. It goes without saying that they had to be very economical at first, and neither drank, smoked, nor gambled. One, when asked how he made his first thousand, replied, That's very simple. I didn't spend it. The second class of men court fame, not so mercenary but vainer than the first. Their sole desire, as expressed by Hotspur, quote, Methinks it were an easy task to pluck bright honor from yon pale-faced moon, or at a bound to dive into the vasty deep, and drag up drowned honor by the locks, so I might without co-rival wear all her dignities. And so the vain peacock struts across the stage. The third class appears murmuring, I go forth among men, armored in a pure intent. Great work is to be done, and whether I stand or crownless fall, it matters not so God's work be done, for I have learned to prize the lightning deed, nor heed the thunder following after which men call fame. End quote. 
to this class may belong every honest, earnest, sober, brotherly working man who plays well the part assigned to him. It is a truth that should be pondered over by all, that for failure in life, as a rule, the fault is not in our stars, but in ourselves. We must all learn the great truth that only competence is desirable, almost necessary, wealth non-essential, and when it does come, it is only a sacred trust to be administered for the general good. When this lesson is truly learnt, the thirst for wealth will lessen, and it will cease to be the object of keen pursuit by men in general, which it never has been with professional classes. People will soon see that it does not bring happiness to its possessors, and is generally injurious to their children. The wise man engaged in business will seek only a moderate competence, and then devote himself to public affairs, laboring for the good of others, especially in his own community. The writer has had occasion to visit many cities and meet the civic authorities, mayors, and members of council. Deeply impressed he has been with their characters and abilities, and especially with the large number who have risen from the ranks of the poor to eminence. Not seldom the mayor has done so. Much of their time is devoted to the careful management of municipal affairs, although few have ceased to pursue their regular occupations. They are happy in leading useful, worthy lives, conscious that they labor no longer solely for themselves, but for their less fortunate fellows. It is cheering to find that working men can and do rise so often to high positions and perform great public service in their maturer years. Useful and happy lives these men lead, striving in their later years to improve the conditions of life for their neighbors, thus making one little spot of earth just a little bit better than they found it. That spot, in many cases, the dearest spot on earth to them, the spot where they were born. For useful service to others, for personal happiness and sweetest satisfaction, for all that makes life desirable and hallows departure at last, Millionaires, as a class, have good cause to envy the town councillors. Mayors, provosts, and councilmen should hesitate long before desiring exchange of positions, even with multimillionaires. There is nothing inherently valuable in mere money worth striving for, unless it is to be administered as a sacred trust for the good of others. Otherwise, the moderate competence suffices to give honored old age the crown end of section 12 of the empire of business by andrew carnegie recording by tom carroll